Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming uh, to this, which is the third session of our um, McMaster Seminar on Higher Education, which, as you may remember, also has the subtitle Practice, Policy, and Public Life. And uh, to, today we're very much concerned with the practice side of uh, this range of issues. Uh, the seminar series, to remind you, was created to encourage a dialogue and to inspire critical thought on the university campus and in the broader community about the place of higher education uh, in our society as it presently exists and in the society we would like it to become. Uh, so we've had uh, uh, two, two talks before this. Uh, most recently, Andrew Furco, who was the lecturer at our last session, uh, speaking about the way in which community engagement uh, can advance institutional goals, um, but also sounding a note about how carefully this needs to be done to ensure that not only the educational goals are realized, but that the community benefits also. And then coming up on March the 15th will be David Theo Goldberg, uh, speaking as part of the Public Intellectuals Project. Uh, this is March the 15th at 7.30 in CIBC Hall. And he will be talking on the afterlife of the humanities. For those of us in the humanities, this is surprising news. <laughs> that, that it's dead. But, uh, however, nice to know there's an afterlife. <laughs> or at least that the imagination can play with the idea of one. So today's session is a panel discussion uh, featuring winners of the President's Awards for Teaching and Learning and I'll take advantage of uh, uh, the, op the opportunity to of course remind you a little bit more about the awards. Um, the, uh, there are three categories for the President's Awards, uh, one for course or resource design, uh, another for, the, uh, for instruction. Um, and also for educational leadership, so individuals can be nominated for President's Award in, in, in awards in any of these three categories. And uh, just to encourage you, nominations are open for the current year's uh, President's Awards until March the 15th. Uh, today, our panelists will be able to share their experience and their expertise um, their expertise uh, that they've developed in conceptualizing, developing, and implementing community-engaged learning projects that enhance student learning and also uh, bring benefits to the broader community. So, let me see. I think this is the point at which I will pass the floor over to Sue Baptiste, uh, a 2003 President's Award winner in Educational Leadership who's from the School of Rehabilitation Science, and she will get our panel started. Thanks very much. I must admit that was a bit of a shock. You mean it's 2003? <laughs> oh my lord, that's, that's nine years ago, for goodness sake. I was so young then. It was one of those things. Good afternoon. It's good to see everyone, and it's rather nice to see a few people have dared to come to the front because it's so much nicer to have a cluster for a conversation than a rather spread out, as if you're out there sort of chewing the cut in the field. You're a bit far away, so if you could come forward, it would be really nice. Invitation. And everyone goes, oh no, if I don't look at her, she can't see me. That is not true. Anyway. Um, I'd like to introduce the panel, um, all of whom I've either heard of or have met or know well. So it's very good to be able to say who's here today. I do pass on a somewhat unfortunate piece of news that Walter will not be able to join us. He had to leave for family health emergency, so we wish him well. Um, at the moment, we have the four ladies who've suddenly become a ladies thing, or a women's thing, whichever you prefer to say. Um, I'd like to introduce Anne Herring, Jean Wilson, Patty Solomon, and Sheila Salmon. But I'm going to ask each one of them to just briefly give you a little bit of a, an idea of why they agreed to sit at this, on this stage this afternoon and what they bring to the conversation. And it doesn't have to be in this order if you don't want. Um, you can start with Sheila if you like, just to be different. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, my biggest problem is the chair does not go up, and I'm five foot one, <laughs> so I need a booster chair. Uh, but I will settle in and try and be comfortable. 
Um, why did I agree? Uh, I guess because of many reasons. The kind of frivolous reason is Sue Vajaki from the Center for Leadership and Learning kind of coerced me <laughs> into doing this a while ago, and uh, I agreed. Um, she and I have traveled a few journeys together, and uh, it, it, it was good to be able to say yes. But the more significant and the more substantial reason is because I have a passion for community-engaged learning. And that passion isn't just uh, related to social work, which is my discipline, um, but it's related to kind of the belief that um, we learn in relationship and in a reciprocal arrangement with the environment around us. And our students learn from their community, and the university can learn from the community, and we also can offer something to the community. So we'll t I'll pick up more on that later on. Is that all you want, or Absolutely. do you want a litany of things that... No, uh, all right, thank you. Piece. Thank you very much. Uh, we can look you up on the web. Yes, you can. see your CV. So thank you. So I'll use the P word as well, I guess the passion word. Um, I have a passion for education and curriculum innovation. And I guess part of my motivation stems from my experience working with people living with HIV. Uh, I think the HIV community is the gold standard in terms of knowing how to uh, engage with the university and engage with the others in the community for the betterment of all. And so I've learned a lot um, from my dealings with both education and research with the HIV community. Um, but I've also been involved in a number of, of uh, innovations in clinical education with physiotherapy and occupational therapy students. And I guess my one last passion is, relates to interprofessional education. I was, was the lead of the program for interprofessional education and research um, in the faculty of health sciences. And I truly believe that engaging in the community is sort of the pinnacle of working together in an interprofessional, multidisciplinary way. So those are my passions that brought me here today. Lovely. OK. Jean, how about you? Is this on? Or? Yes, you are. Oh, OK. Um, well, we had a retreat for President's uh, Teaching Award winners at the end of June, which was just a fantastic community event. Um, so in response to that, really, and just wanting to be part of the ongoing conversation mm -hmm. that's happening um, here right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anne. Um, I, I have to say uh, that I, I certainly agree with what, what Jean said. The, uh, the event that we had last June was and, you know, a great opportunity to meet people who are um, really dedicated to uh, teaching and learning and, and finding new ways to do it. Um, I was interested in participating today because of that, but also because I have, over the years, uh, been very interested in practical applications of my discipline, which is anthropology, and fieldwork is a key element that defines what anthropologists do. And so I've tried over the years to develop ways to get my students to do field work here in Hamilton, and hence, um, in a number of ways, have had them become engaged uh, with the community and, and the community engaged with them. So I thought it was a great opportunity to find out what other people are doing. I'm hoping to steal ideas like crazy from everybody here, and also to share some of the things I've done if they're useful to you. Excellent. It's a very nice uh, span, I think, of experiences and people and interests, so that's excellent. Um, in order to make this more of a collegial conversation, I'm, I'm going to suggest that which way would you like us to work? We have a list of questions here. It could be mind-numbingly boring if we went from question to question, expecting each one to be discreet and isolated in its own way. And of course, they aren't. But there are clusters of concepts that are within each of the questions. So would you like to, each of you, have 10 minutes to say what you're all about? Or would you like to kick start with maybe the first question and see where it takes us? Start and see where we go. Start and see where we go. OK. So I guess, the, the, to me, the first two questions fit together. And the first is, how do we define community? What do we mean by community and by community engagement? And the other one is, what is our community? professional, McMaster, municipal, whatever. And so I think maybe that's the context for the first piece of our conversation. Who'd like to start? <laughs> oh, yes, they will, Anne, believe you me. I'll give it a stab. <laughs> okay, sure. 
Um, I, th I think when we start talking about community, we get really narrow because we start thinking about something that's all the same, that people are all the same. And I think one of the first things I learned in social work communities class back in the 70s was that there's no one simple definition of community. Com there are communities that are geographically bound. There are communities of interests. There are communities of identities. There are communities that are formed because of their being for excuse me, forced to be communities, and there are communities that come together because they care about each other and care about a shared experience. So I think when we talk about communities, we can make a real mistake at McMaster if we think that the only community that we have out there, and I think sometimes this is the way we think about it, is the social, the people in need out in the Hamilton community. That that's the narrow definition of what the McMaster community engagement might look like. My belief is that community is here on campus. Community is perhaps international communities. Communities could be communities of uh, peoples in other parts of Canada. Community can be a very broad, self-defined kind of situation. Was part of the question what community <coughs> engagement is? Yes. I All right. Think might as well bite the whole thing. All right. I'm going to bite it. <laughs> the community engagement, I think, is really a, a, an important concept as well. And then I think if we, if we think about community engagement only in terms of what can McMaster do for the communities, <coughs> we're really missing out on something and we're narrowing what we can be doing. Sometimes when we think of community engagement, we think about students doing service um, and that students our McMaster students would go out and do something for the community and they will get something out of that experience. And hopefully the community would get something out of it. Or maybe sometimes we think that maybe they'll do some research in the community and they will give something to the community. That's very much based on the assumption that we know what they can give and we know what should be researched. And my belief and as I talk to people in the communities that I encounter, it's not so much about what we know we can give, but it should be perhaps driven by what does the community want, need, and appreciate? And how can we match both our students' learning opportunities with the community needs? And you'll hear me talk a lot about re reciprocity in this whole thing. A second kind of thing we think of when we think of community engagement is community research or re research. And again, it comes from this position of, well, what, what we can give to the world, what we can give as researchers. And again, I guess it's important to challenge ourselves to think about community engagement as also what can the community give us as far as knowledge, but also design ideas around what they need. What does the community need? not so much what we need to research. Another thing that we sometimes think about with communities that we, well, community engagement is bringing experts in from the community to teach our classes or co-teach our classes or speak. And that's community engagement because they're engaging with the community and they're engaging with our students. And again, that's a really valuable piece. But it's not only just experts that we learn from. We learn from the everyday folks in our community, the everyday people who live the lives of the community, and those people maybe can teach us here in the academy more than we can teach them. An example of that, and Jean will probably talk about this, is the recent discovery program that we, we had through um, a group of people, some of whom are in this audience, but uh, through Arts and Sciences, where McMaster offered access to knowledge to people who might normally have a, a barrier to knowledge meaning they may not have the resources to take courses, to have access to the things that we take for granted in our classrooms, offer an opportunity for knowledge to people. And we had a uh, professor teaching it. And the outcome of that was how much we learned, not just what the people learned, how much we learned about ourselves, about the university, about knowledge, and about education. So the point of the reciprocity of community engagement is the thing that I'm sort of talking about. Enough of me. Thank you, Sheila. Good start off point. Who would like to respond or add their own two cents or a dime even? Okay. 
give an example of um, some of our work, and I guess picking up on what you said is really looking at meaningful engagement. So that it's not just tokenism, it's not just participation of the of the community. It's actually engagement um, with the community in a in a meaningful way. Um, and uh, and I also re I'm reflecting on how much I've learned in working with various communities. One of our innovations. Um, related to uh, my realization about 10 years ago that, in fact, there wasn't a lot of, in our curriculum about HIV and disability. And perhaps not surprising because disability um, was not that common in the community because it was a fatal, considered to be a fatal illness and now that people are living longer, it's actually considered to be uh, a chronic episodic illness. And so I decided that I would like to include some of that in my, uh, in my, in my curriculum in the physiotherapy and occupational therapy programs. And I approached the local uh, AIDS uh, service organization in the community with my colleague, Dr. Dale Gunter. And our project involved developing and working with people living with HIV to be educators in, and facilitate learning in the tutorial setting. Not just passive participants, not just being interviewed, but actually gaining skills like we teach faculty to be facilitators of learning. And of course, I thought, oh, this is going to be a fabulous learning experience for our students. And it was. I mean, how the impact they had on in, in their interactions with the, we call them community tutors, um, was fantastic. But what I didn't realize was the impact it would have on the actual people living with HIV. Um, it was so empowering to them. It gave them skills. They felt valued. Uh, it was a phenomenal experience uh, that I learned from. And my proudest uh, part of this whole program was the fact that we were able to um, give back that program to the AIDS service community. And to this day, they run it. It's, and they supply um, community educators to various educational programs. We're not even involved anymore, but it is, was very much a reciprocal relationship where we learned from them, they learned from us, and now they were able to take that on in the community. Yes, having been one of the co-tutors is one of the people living with HIV. It was a, a wonderful experience. I learned so much from that woman. I'll never forget it. Okay. Jean, are we going in serried ranks assembled here? Are we going to Jean? Okay. Sure. Oh, this is better. Oh, there you go. <clears throat> well, I'm a literary scholar, and commonly one might think, how engaged can that be? How practical can that be? Um, and I'm very aware of <laughs> President Dean sitting there. Um, <laughs> So, um, I received the President's Award for Excellence in Teaching, not because I'm a wonderful lecturer, but because I think um, I helped open a space for community engagement um, in the literary classroom. And some of the examples from literature that I just wanted to mention, I think, uh, articulate ideals of community engagement. So, um, for instance, 100 Years of Solitude, um, some of you may have read that. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, description of a father and his sons engaging in hallucinating sessions. And they, they're interdisciplinary, they just explore all manner of, of subjects and uh, give to each other, the text says, their best hours. And I think that's a wonderful idea of, of community. Um, it's about giving and receiving. Um, um, in another literary example, I mean, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, the creature, has no community, he has no name, he has no place, and he longs to be an actor in the busy scene. So community is a place of agency, it, it, it's a place of engagement. Um, but going back to 100 Years of Solitude, what happens, they're merrily, um, you know, learning away, engaged uh, creatively in, uh, in this community of learning. Um, and then the gypsies come. One tribe of gypsies are heralds of progress. The other are um, said to be uh, purveyors of amusement. And the one group appeals to those in the community who would see a flying carpet, for instance, as a means of transport. This is useful. Um, this is good for us. Um, the other tribe of gypsies appeal to those in the community who saw a flying carpet as a source of amusement, of recreation. Hui, this is fun. But, though, but it created um, a divide in the community and um, they succumbed to these dichotomies of useful, useless, amusement, progress, arts, <laughs> sciences. Um, and that led to a vulnerability in the, uh, in the culture 
to the point where people became disconnected. Um, at one point, the father engages in all these um, experiments in alchemy, and he separates gold and says to his son, the son that he'd previously been, you know, happily engaged in, in learning with, and he says to his son, what does, look, what do you see here? And the son said, oh, it looks to me like, he says, answers quite honestly, it looks like dog shit. It's this yellowish mass of, of stuff. He doesn't see it as gold, as precious. And the father slaps him across the face um, because he doesn't see things the way the father sees. Um, and a different, so, so the community loses its capacity to um, make and share meaning. Uh, to really know where it's going, and they end up um, going nowhere uh, together. Um, in contrast to that um, development, we have something like um, the model we see in, in Don Quixote, um, where, you know, this is how I see things, it's, which is not to say it's the only way to see things. Um, and it's open to challenge, so let's see um, if, this, if this makes sense. So um, community learning as a place of where there's an assumed uh, shared intelligence, where there's a space for um, uh, giving and, and receiving, reciprocity, mutuality, um, and an assumption that um, this is how I see things, but I want to know how you see them <laughs> and what we'll, what we'll make of that. So um, it's a... Community, I think these literary examples suggest are, it, it involves a continual remaking, um, a process where community is constantly questioning its own assumptions and um, um, with an awareness too that community is not monolithic, we're all parts of overlapping communities. Um, so we're bringing things to the, to the process. We're coming from different places. Um, Community isn't given, I think it's created, it's, um, um, it's maintained, um, and it's, um, it's experienced. You know it when you have it. <laughs> um, it can't be a given, it can't be imposed, um, but it's, it's where, where life is or where life uh, happens. Uh, and it's that place really, as I see it, um, where we engage, as Patrick said at the beginning, in critiquing the world we have and creatively shaping the world we want. Um, and to, so the, the discovery program um, arose from, um, I was at a conference on interdisciplinary education and the most fun people at the conference were people engaged in this kind of um, uh, community learning beyond the, uh, the walls of the campus, but, but not on the assumption that there's this, that the the master community, the university community, and the broader community are mutually exclusive, but we're, you know, it involves many, many overlapping uh, communities. Um, and so um, this collaborative uh, venture um, took shape in the fall, and um, one of the arts and science students um, who was part of that process said it was the most valuable experience he's had at McMaster, and he's in his third year, so that uh, tells us something about what's going on. Um, I've been sort of, I've been rambling, not sort of rambling, I have been rambling, um, but I just, I think, I was talking with Anne earlier, and I just sort of wanted to say, throw out a, a few things um, to maybe, um, I guess, challenge the assumption that there are um, that, that divide between the ornamental and the functional. You know, what it's nice to know and what it's necessary to know. And um, I think, so community, communities of learning that are interdisciplinary keep that space open and alive and allow for, um, for shared um, investments mm -hmm. in, in where, where, wherever it is we're going. Excellent, thanks. Sorry. Um, G and. <coughs> Well, I guess I come at this from a, from a very different point of view. Um, although many of the ideas that have been shared um, already, I, I certainly espouse. But I came to uh, doing more of community engaged <clears throat> teaching um, out of a frustration with what I felt was um, 
not enough happening in the traditional seminar context. And uh, thinking that our students were much more capable than um, I was creating opportunities for them to demonstrate using the old tools of paper writing and so on. And I had the opportunity in <clears throat> when the uh, uh, double cohort was coming through, uh, the chair of my department asked me if I would uh, put on a fourth year seminar. And he asked me on a Friday and said, can you tell me on Monday what it will be? And I thought about it <laughs> over the weekend. And, and I thought, you know, I'm going to do something I've always wanted to do. I'm going to get the students to write a book. And the students will be writing a book about Hamilton. And so part of what I wanted to do was unleash um, what I knew was their abilities, because I had seen it before, their creativity, but also make a connection between them, their learning, and what was happening in Hamilton. And uh, the outcome of that was when I proposed to the students in the first day of class, we're going to write a book, and it's going to be about Hamilton. And you all have to write a chapter. And we're writing it for the people of Hamilton. So you have to forget all the jargon and nonsense that we usually require that you do, and understand the concepts and write it in a way that's accessible to people. And they picked up the ball, and they ran with it, and they decided they wanted to have high production values. They didn't want it to look like courseware. They wanted to sell it at the bookstore. And the result was this book, Anatomy of a Pandemic, which was about the 1918 flu in Hamilton. And um, they were so buzzed by their connection with getting out of the university, going to the Hamilton Public Library of all places, uh, which none of them had ever been to before, which was a surprise to me, but it makes sense. We have a wonderful library system here. Why would you, you know, go beyond that? Uh, they visited archives all over the Hamilton area and beyond. They met archivists, they met volunteers, and um, the end result was they not only became very knowledgeable about Hamilton from many perspectives, because they had to build in a theoretical perspective in the chapter that they were writing. So some of them talked about social inequality, some of them talked about the way people connected in social organization and so on. So they became very knowledgeable about a wide range of subjects, and, and they wrote very, very well about it. And we were all so excited about it that um, I've kept doing it every year, even though it, it nearly kills me to do it. Um, but the students are very um, happy to be connected, and, and they're surprised by what they find by going outside of the university and um, investigating a subject matter. We, we do it sort of as a problem-based learning <coughs> format with the overlay of inquiry because they're asking questions. But um, all of this made me uh, very aware of the way in which we can connect our students to people outside of the university who in turn will be interested in what we're doing. I have to admit, I'm very hands-on about saying I decide what the topic is. There's no democracy there. There's no input from the general public in Hamilton about you know, what, what we should do because it has to be within you know, an area in which I feel I have a little bit of expertise. Um, but it, then it gets played out in other ways because members of the public will come and they'll, they hear about the book because we get some uh, publicity through The Spectator. Um, I recently did a, a small gig at the Children's University, which is another fantastic new initiative. I'm very excited about this. And I talked about the 1918 influenza pandemic in Hamilton to 8 to 12 year olds, which was Frightening. <laughs> I'm I've never been so nervous in all my life uh, as I was before this thing. But it was, it's another way of kind of turning it back in a number of different ways. So uh, I suppose um, there's no single way of doing, connecting with the community. And my suggestion would be that we all have probably specific ways in which we can do it and that we're comfortable with. And I think together, we make a very nice tapestry of connections. And, and we should have as many ways as, as possible as engaging, of engaging with the community. Oh, I am interested. Anyway, it's not my job to ask questions right now. Uh, maybe what would be helpful is to, I've, I've just been jotting down a few emerging constructs as people have been talking and <clears throat> speaking a little bit about 
community really is what we want to define it as, is it not? It becomes a group, from what I can hear people say, of people with shared understanding of reciprocity. It doesn't have to be the same beliefs, it just is shared understanding and reciprocity. That there's celebration of diversity and exploration of sameness and difference. But there is a, de a declared or expected common purpose in some way. Is that what you've all been saying? Say no, so you're full of bunk if you wish. I just want to get things started. I just want to add something. I think with the advent of the internet, it has really changed our concept mm. of a geographical community. Um, so now our community is the world, and so I think we have to think about that when we think about the way people connect. It's you know, very different than it was a generation ago. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Anyone else want to add to that? Any comments from the floor? What do you think community is? Does it make sense what they're saying? <laughs> yes? I have a question. Um, a lot of times we talk about community as a very distinct binary of the master and the community out there in here. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to um, maybe other models or concepts in terms of like when our students leave campus or they live in a community with their neighbors, in terms of their identities as a master and community member, as a campus or a community member, or a member of all these intersecting um, how can we promote an idea that's less of a, a binary about the I didn't hear the last part of your question. Sorry. I don't know. Uh, I think it's uh, how can we promote an idea that um, being a part of the community can be engaged is less of a the like, master community versus not versus, mm -hmm. which uh, in terms of our relationship with the community as opposed to being part of. Oh, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if we invite our students and our faculty and our staff to even have conversations uh, about their broader lives, the communities that they're part of, how those communities may intersect with the business of what goes on here and how the business that goes on here might intersect with the variety of things that go on there. I, I keep having these little daydreams about um, why don't we have classes uh, in an evening and people going to the art crawl and some of the people in the class likely are Hamiltonians who know about the art crawl and then bring it back to a classroom and talk a little bit about the meaning either of community or urban renewal or the function of art in their society, or they can come back into classrooms to talk about that, but bringing the, their own community's experiences back. I have no idea if that's what you were asking. Anyone else have anything they want to add into this particular piece? Well, I don't know if this is adding anything, but in the, um, in, in the course that I do, um, the students quickly appreciate how embedded they are in Hamilton. Uh, whilst beforehand, and this is because they tell me, not because I've inferred it, um, but, they, but they do make a connection that they might not have made before, even though they've been students at McMaster for four years. And um, so I think while we don't want to think of it as us going out and colonizing uh, the people of Hamilton, at the same time, by, by connecting through a, a variety of projects, the students do start looking at Hamilton and the people of Hamilton in a different way. And I think, as well, the people that they encounter on their, um, in their work think about them differently, as well. And, and perhaps they think about McMaster differently, too. So I think some of the connections are very subtle, and some of them actually don't materialize till, you know, m much later. But I think there's some things that we can do that are very obvious, and there are things that are not so obvious but still have an impact on, you know, a, a, a reciprocal impact. Yes, and I'm wondering if it helps if we think of community in terms of a concept as opposed to a physical thing that could be made.
measured or observed. Uh, because for me, I think that takes some of those boundaries away. That's not to say that a measurable, visible community isn't a community. But maybe for our purposes, it's, it's a little more ethereal or a little less concretized than, than that. Yes, Jane. Yeah, um, I think that binary is um, related to another common binary that, you know, people say, oh, it's almost as important what you do outside the classroom as in it. And what they really mean is it's more important. And it has the effect of, you know, devaluing what goes on in the classroom mm -hmm. and creating a false binary. Um, and I love what, you know, Sheila was saying about bringing into the classroom, we're all coming. <laughs> and many of us are, I mean, live in Hamilton, <laughs> you know. Also, there's this danger of thinking, Master community is somehow composed of people who aren't a part of you know, this geographical uh, location. But beyond that, um, thinking about it not in terms of identities, but perhaps positionality. Mm -hmm. um, and an example there I think of is uh, Joy Kagawa's Obasan, the, the last line of that, and it's all about you know, displacement, dislocation. Um, you know, and, and this pressure to define uh, you know, for her to define herself as a Japanese Canadian and uh, the desperation to keep community together in, uh, the t at the time of the um, internment. The last line of that novel is, if she um, moved her head, if I move my head in a certain way, I can smell the flowers from where I am. So that attention to, to agency positionality, um, finding her way in a multiplicity of, of overlapping communities. It's a space, it's a place. Yes, um, that is perhaps fleeting yeah. on, many, on many occasions. And community becomes defined by its members rather than the members being defined by, you know, yeah. rather than that identity being imposed uh, upon them, so. Yes. I, I, was, I was thinking about, um, people learn about communities, I mean, a, a, one way of learning about community, even if your study is community, is to walk about, to do a walkabout, to do an observation, to hang out at the Tim Hortons and to talk with some of the people. Um, it's not service, it's learning. Now, the only danger in when it comes to the people talking piece is the exploitation of the people that they're serving our learning needs. But the idea of being out and about and observing to walk through the pathways and to walk through the downtown and to walk through some of the older neighborhoods and to look at, there's all sorts of things that can be learned. The question for us educators is how do we bring that back in to the classroom to make that part and parcel of what we're um, supposedly educating about. And of course that's discipline specific, right? I mean you can't I can't at all speak to what a chemist might might ask his students to be doing or her students to be doing while they're out walking about in, in Hamilton. But 
how much do we offer in the beginning of courses to ask the students to bring in their experiences or to go out and observe and bring in those experiences. For learning to be valuable, I think we have to give some sort of theoretical framework, a reason we're doing something. We have to have some sort of learning objectives attached to it. But then there's an activity, and that's what engaged learning or experiential learning is all about. And that has to be negotiated as Anne, Anne says, you know, the, the instructor has to know something about what they're suggesting and, and giving some parameters to it. But how do we invite students to take their experiences and or their observed experiences and bring them back in and link it back to the course curriculum. And I can only speak my, about my own discipline. I don't know what people might do in other disciplines. But I can't believe there are too many places on a university campus that there isn't some relevance to the real world. Yes. Yeah, I think that's a terrific idea that, uh, you know, once the students have this ability, then the next phase of the course is, okay, you go and you edit your own book and you work with people in the community on a subject that they find, the community, whatever it might be, the subject they might find interesting. Um, we also put the books in, in the libraries, in the public libraries, in the archives, and wherever anybody helped the class, 
copies of the books go there. But um, I like that idea of then turning the students into the teachers. Um, I'm going to have to think about how to do that. And you can also build on some of the community members involved in helping them co-teach and whatever. I'm going to just really take off on that. Patty, you wanted to say something. Um, I think meaningful community engagement is really hard work. It takes a long time to develop mutual trust. You have to learn and know about each other's goals and understandings and misgivings. And I think it's really hard work. And I think, um, certainly from the academic uh, perspective, sometimes it's very easy for us to think that we're experts and know everything when we're going in. I mean, that's what we're bred to be experts. Um, so it's, uh, it's hard to get, get away from that. But it, it, I don't think we can fool ourselves. These are not easy things to do. Um, to organize, uh, we do another um, event where we have uh, 120 students go out into the community to uh, observe and interact with people living with disabilities so that they can understand what their experiences are like in the community. How much time does it take to organize 120 students going out? It takes a lot of time. Do they get an unbelievably meaningful experience that they would never get sitting in the classroom with us talking to them with PowerPoint? Absolutely, if they, would, if they don't forget this. But it is very time consuming and it takes a long time to develop those partnerships in the community. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. Yes, Jean. I have just one thought. Um, Jeanette Eby, who was the coordinator of the Discovery Program, is a McMaster grad. I knew her from the literary classroom. She just made her way out into the community. I'm wondering about, you know, one person at a time. She went out there and, without permission, you know, and engaged. Um, and so she was the, and a number of us knew her and she became, you know, the obvious person. Um, the impact she's had has been tremendous yeah. and in a very um, humble, she has, you know, great humility and just moved. But, uh, you know, um, so that's maybe another way. It doesn't take the logistical organizing, but um, to create those spaces and those energies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sure. I think our business is about helping the people we're charged with the privilege of educating to learn from these experiences and to go forward and do things, whether they're teaching people how to write books or whether they're engaging with the community or um, engaging as in political actions or in joining the conservation area as they walk or whatever. It's, it, you know, if we give people the opportunity, they can do it. But I think Susan's point is a very important one. How do we make an impact without it being us moving from the position of experts to make that impact? How do we engage in the conversation, which you know, Patty is, is pointing out, takes a lot of work. Um, to really engage with community partners in a conversation around what does the community believe, what are, or communities believe, that we can be helpful with, as opposed to determining what we think we can do for them. And I think that's, that's where a lot of the hard work comes in. In social work, um, every year we place 140 social work students for two days a week for the entire academic year placements. That doesn't happen without an awful lot of background work by multiple faculty, faculty members in the School of Social Work, where we're working with the community around what, what do you need from us, but at the same time saying to them, but we need this from you. And you can't just use them for filing, they have to learn, and students you also have to give. And hopefully through that process, later on, they're giving back in other ways. But that, that engagement with the, the community to really iron out what they need and what we need and coming up with some mutual learning opportunities is incredibly time consuming, incredibly rewarding. We've got other examples, but that's one for now. <laughs> damage the relationship with that neighborhood 
um, or that you'd be never willing to begin with. So I'm wondering about sort of what you know from the literature or um, your own experience in terms of promoting or creating an environment that we can sustain that um, engagement of the university with whatever our community is. Patrick, did you I mean, it's an ethical dilemma in some ways, right? You don't want to create the need. The students go there for six weeks and then they, you never see them again. So I think we, we cannot do that. We have to look at things in the long term. We can't create you know, one-time, six-week placements unless we're going to give something back to them that allows them to move forward. So uh, I'll give an example from our occupational therapy students who went to work with the city of Burlington because they had a request um, they didn't know how to integrate children with disabilities into their sports camps in the summer. So we sent some students in for six weeks, but they trained staff and they left them with packages of information and learning so that they could continue with this on their own. That would be very different than them going in for six weeks and actually working with the kids and doing everything and then leaving. So I think we have to carefully think about what the models the models that we are proposing, what are the long-term implications, and I don't think that we can go in and just parachute in and for our own needs. Yeah. Also, uh, in terms of sustainability, and you talk about the, like, the number of hours of work that go into doing these things. I think about the sustainability for individual instructors doing this kind of work if the departments and the departments um, Can you comment? Well, it's a happy exhaustion, <laughs> and it's a happy exhaustion because the whole classroom setting is completely different, mm -hmm. because the students are excited about being treated respectfully as authors. They're excited that they've been able to um, choose their own subject matter and have the professor act as a, you know, a mentor and a guide rather than someone who's marking. I have a very um, set series of things that they do and I give them feedback over each phase of the writing and um, so it's tiring but at the same time I'm so much happier having that um, excitement in the classroom I get so much out of it they get so much out of it compared to what I would normally do that as I say it's it's a happy exhaustion I'm quite uh, delighted to spend the time even what though it's a lot <laughs> She's not going to do it again. I'm never going to do it again. <laughs> where, where do these really really one-off things go if, if it's bound to a single instructor? But it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. I've been invited to give talks about this particular course yes. in other places. Yes. And people have taken it up. People have taken it up uh, at McMaster from time to time. Um, and it's not going to work for everybody simply because, you know, it, it, it's, it's probably uh, very uh, personal. But um, there's no reason why other people can't be turning students into knowledge producers. And, and that's essentially what I'm trying to do rather than just going to the library and citing what everyone else has done. I'm standing here looking at some maybe potential general principles here. And Something that's very obvious to me is the setting free of learners with faculty partnership to explore something totally new, with a very similar goal at the end of it, but that the way to get there is very different. And I think if we model those kinds of processes that have never existed, then it becomes a much more transferable thing, right? So it's not incumbent based. It's not, you know, God, Anne's gone now. We won't have that course again. It's in fact the absolute opposite. This is a legacy. We have a responsibility to ensure this grows as time goes on, right? But I think part of that really does mean that there has to be a, an institutional structure that provides for that kind of um, opportunity for at least the instructors who want to do it or who are inspired to do it or the departments that are. Um, I could not do the work I do in the education I do if I didn't have the kind of department I have and, the kind of and be located in the faculty in which I have that support this kind of learning. Um, and I think that's part of what I think Patrick is saying about his initiative is let's figure out what makes this sustainable. The other piece though is how do we also create com a community of instructors that 
um, share some common vision and, su and support each other in their way of, of learning. There's community of practice for some of, some of the um, community initiatives. I, I was privileged enough to be part of the social science inquiry uh, project when it first started. And we had a community of instructors that met every single week to review what we were doing for a number of years because we were so excited about how we were engaging the students with some real life situations as well as some textbook book kinds of things. And it was that the sustained community of, of instructors that also made a difference. So that's a piece of it. But that again has to have institutional support. Mm -hmm. Sorry folks, I was so engaged. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, talking about sustainability, so I'm a student and I don't, I don't know if you show me you know, what they see as principles of doing community-engaged research or community-engaged learning and teaching. Um, and I think that a lot of graduate students don't have that training, and how do you teach graduate students to be the next mm -hmm. uh, faculty members to do this kind of work? Well, I, if I may, I think um, you're identifying, you put your finger on you know, a real issue that I think we have a problem with here at McMaster. And that is um, the only way you're going to be able to mentor uh, graduate students to take on these uh, different ways of, of, of teaching is by having them involved in it from the beginning and have them co-designing and co-teaching um, these kinds of courses. And it has to be possible to, to have um, a teaching assistant or or co-teacher, which is the way I like to think of it, um, <clears throat> for a class that is reasonably small. I mean, this is part of the investment in good teaching, is to match up graduate students, perhaps those who have taken uh, a number of the courses that CLL offers, with professors who are you know, doing work that, that the grad student themselves thinks is interesting, might not even be in their subject field but then providing the money for the TA, for the TA ship that allows them to co-teach and, and, and be mentored and learn how to do these things. We don't have anything, as far as I know, at McMaster that permits that. And I would really think that would be a, a step we should be thinking about going in. For those courses that have these kinds of experiential opportunities, if you, if you can, if you're lucky enough to have a TA for them, for example, Sandra Preston in, in social work teaches a course on advocacy and social movements. It's, she gives the theory, she pulls in mentors from the community, the stu and there's a TA, at least one TA, sometimes more, working alongside her, designing and planning. The students go out into the community and work on a social action or advocacy pro project. They have to present it publicly, a poster session, and link it all back to the theory. That's an example of community participation, a minor impact. It's not necessarily sustainable, but maybe, maybe it is in some cases, and an opportunity for TAs to work, walk alongside. But again, there has to be an opportunity, a need to have a TA. I think there's 90 students in the class, or 70 students, or some large number for that many people out in the community. I think the other opportunity is that um, I, I, this was an undergraduate student who had an opportunity to work um, in inquiry with me. And uh, she was a psychology fourth year student and was able to talk the department into giving her a credit for being a tutorial. She was never a TA because that would have been wrong. She didn't mark papers or anything, but she was a facilitator alongside me. And so she had an opportunity to teach in a different way than the classic TA position or the classic even instructor position and to learn some of the principles behind how, how to go about teaching inquiry. It's creating those kinds of opportunities for students and there was a whole academic piece that she had to do as well. You, and then after you, you first, you then, yes, right. We're also, as we talk about um, transforming and institutionalizing you know, some of these things um, and we talk about community, I think we also have to remember that within our own community we have um, we have some supports in terms of our staff. 
and our services that we offer. So um, I, coming from the student services side of things, I also would encourage us to really think about how our student services can support um, some of these things that are happening in the classroom. So you know, I immediately see connections with what Anne's doing and, um, and our career services. Um, I know that uh, Jean is working with Michelle in terms of our summer reading program, but you know, I read an article um, just this past week around um, somewhere in the States where they, they take their summer reading programs, the students have a shared experience, um, the academic intellectual kind of experience around reading a book, new students, and then um, it becomes something in orientation week where they get they gather in small groups with um, with professors and instructors that they're going to be working with, and they go out to the community and they have dinner. So I mean, clearly there's money that, that you know, to support them. So I'm saying this is an example of how you can take um, sort of that academic mission and um, and introduce that in a, in a student service program. And, you know, it's just a, just an example of how we can build those partnerships as well and how we can sustain some of the things that perhaps faculty are spending time doing, maybe there is some administrative support available um, in the student services. Interesting. Yes. I want to build off the point that Sheila made about the undergraduate students who you had in your inquiry course. My question is, could we be doing a better job of harnessing the abilities of the students who go through these experiential education courses, maybe in the form of peer mentors or being a TA but not really a TA in the case that you were talking about. Because there's so many undergraduate students who go through these courses and they have these transformative experiences, but sometimes it ends there. And indeed, one of the most important things about engaging in the community is its relationships, and those relationships tend to need to be more long-term to develop. So can we enhance the experiences that are already happening with students by making them more long-term? And in terms of resources, can we be providing learning opportunities I don't think you take the burden off the professor with this. <laughs> I think what you do is you add the burden to the professor. And then we have to think about that. And we as a community has to think about that. To mentor a fourth year brilliant, wonderful psychology student in, in, in teaching inquiry took a lot more time than if I was doing it myself. It was very rewarding, and I hope it was for her. So I think it's, it's again a matter of what kinds of energy do we want, to, what kind of commitments, resource commitments to put into some the idea. But one of the things we can do that maybe we don't talk about is that after we have engaged in these uh, community connected, connected experiences or have facilitated students being part of those, those experiences, do we ever sit back and ask them to write a reflection about well, how are they going to move this forward? Where are they going in their life with this? What are their lifelong learning goals and connection goals? Because this isn't just about, we could sustain it for another year or another two years or another three years, but it's their lives. So we're hopefully pre presenting these conversations, these opportunities to make a sustained <coughs> difference in the world. You know? And so part of our job maybe is to start helping students think through, now what? It isn't just, I felt good about working with the, the folks who uh, are experiencing HIV and AIDS, and I really made a difference. How are you going to do it, make a difference next year, five years from now, and 10 years from now? And that's maybe where some of the sustaining comes in, not necessarily in local community projects, but in the moving it forward as using your education for what you're going to do with this.
One of the things Andrew Furco said when he was here is that in the institution where, institutions where he has worked, and there's been a community engagement initiatives, that they have worked to, um, in the tenure promotions documents, to um, validate and value community engagement as something that moves towards tenure and promotion. And so that's, that's maybe something that, as an institution, we need to look at if we're really talking about engagement as a valuable uh, experience for students, faculty, staff, and community, then that has to be publicly acknowledged. And that may be definitely tenure and promotion, may also be in merit, rec increments, all of the things, at least that, and I can speak from faculty, and I'm sure staff also have their own pathways for considering that as well. as well. First of all, many of our students come from Hamilton. They don't come from away um, to the Westdale bu bubble, but are already um, fully engaged in the Hamilton community. Um, and way of drawing all our students <laughs> together and to be able to reflect on their position, their place in the world. So as Sheila says, they can continue developing um, their uh, creative power if you will, is one thing I've found, and this gets back to the idea of labor, and it reminded me the question about grad student um, training. Often grad students are used as markers because it's assumed that assignments are, you know, who would want to spend time, uh, you know, what faculty member would want to spend their precious time, um, especially marking undergraduate essays. Um, I've found marking undergraduate essays extraordinarily rewarding. Um, seen it as, seen that labor not as um, merely for purposes of evaluation, but um, it's my job, <laughs> you know, it's to work together uh, on these issues and to encourage reflection and self, um, self-critical reflection. So, um, and independent studies, thesis projects, I think there's, 
um, a wealth of opportunity there for faculty members and students to become engaged in, in ways that institutionally we maybe haven't, haven't valued. Um, and that's a way of getting at where people are coming from as they help to redefine what the master community is, um, what the, the broader community, and what all these overlap, how we're, how we're going to move in, um, in these multiple uh, ways that make up Anne's tapestry. Jim? Perception versus reality question. Um, I have a dream, so it's probably perception, it's not reality. But anyway, um, and this, this is something we talked about at the Faculty of Social Science retreat, but it's not just limited to the Faculty of Social Sciences. This is something we would, I would like, we would like to see bigger. Something along the lines, and obviously this hasn't been thought out because it's so kind of monumental, but what about a first year course that, in, that every student who comes to McMaster takes on understanding community? It could be a jazzier title but understanding community. And that could be, we already talked about community is not a simple entity. A piece of it might be understanding the, the environment of Hamilton. But you know, you're, if you're understanding Hamilton, it's not just to understand Hamilton, it's, understand, it's how do you understand. The skill there is how do you open your eyes, observe, understand, link it to something you're learning, and take care of that forward in your learning. So it's not, you know, so maybe we use Hamilton as a laboratory for understanding community, but it isn't an end point, it's a, a process, it's a tool. And that could be, I mean, I don't know what that would look like, but it could be understanding community in the sense of what's the political structures, what the environmental structures, what are the social structures, how, how, how is it diverse, and what does it mean to have diversity, and what does it mean to have wealth disparities, and what does it mean to have beauty and art? I mean, it could be all of those kinds of things or none of those things. It could be unique to a particular fac faculty, or it could be more broadly across the campus. But if every McMaster student was engaged in having to understand community, we then are starting on a lifelong learning of seeing a certain way. Another dream part of that is why couldn't we use some of our fourth year students then as tutors along the way with that? in subgroups of the, doing that. Now they'd have to be trained on how to tutor. You know, and I'm not talking about tutors in the sense of, of TAs. I'm talking about facilitators or, or guides or, you know, we'll talk, we could talk about something different. And maybe we won't ever talk about it. But it's those kinds of things, a bigger picture, how do we engage people in the idea of community and the importance of in community engagement. It may just start a conversation about Brilliant idea. Why don't we do it? Let's just do it. <laughs> that, that's an extraordinary idea. I, I'm with you completely. I'm all excited. I'm writing down the structure as we speak. <laughs> it's all done, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, seriously. Okay, anyone else wants to add anything at this stage? How are you doing out there? Patrick. Gina, mm -hmm. I haven't heard that uh, from Gabriel Garcia Marquez that, that definition of community as. I forget how, how you kind of paraphrase it, but it's individuals giving each other their best yeah, yeah. It's a lot, lovely communication of the community, however you define it, and, and it's very, very fun, the community of the, the instructor with the students, too. It's actually a, a, a great order to be. It's very really wonderful to be. So I, 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 I think that's actually a lovely formulation. But my question really has to do with giving each other our best hours, and, and the point she will make, I entirely agree with and I always have trouble imagining what this means in practice for us in regard to do that. And that's to your point about we're not only interested in learning from the experts in the community, we're interested in learning from all the people in the community. Uh, and implicit in that too is that somehow in all of this, we have to repress something that's in the DNA of every university teacher, which is the assumption that you have something to give that the benign and other does not have. Uh, and that's a really challenging, challenging thing. I mean, if you go into a teaching situation, even if you're resolved to give your best hours, um, uh, how does that what, how does that work as a learning encounter? Does it require the impression of something in itself in order to open oneself to that learning experience? And if so, what is it? The what is the learning how one students learn through through that kind of encounter? Humility is something that's very hard to learn, right? <laughs> and uh, 
I, I do think that there may be something to the idea, and I'm not, again, I don't have it totally formulated, but I won't deny that I'm an expert in something, that I know something about social work. I wouldn't pretend that I don't. On the other hand, it doesn't mean I know about the lived experience of the people with whom I work, or, or the people with whom I help our students to work. So it's what am I open to hearing that builds on what I think I already know, and am I open to having a bit of a different spin or twist to what I think I know based on what I'm hearing? Or can I hold two interpretations of something at the same time, or three or four, and not necessarily come back with, but it has to be this way because that's how I see it, or I know it, or I've learned it. So I think part of it is, is how do I, I know what I know, but also be open to hearing more than what I know, and different than what I know. That's as far as I can go with it. So in terms of the question that's put about training graduate students to engage in this type of teaching, so, sure, is that, that a key thing, that combination of uh, confidence in one's knowledge, but humility in the face of the experience? If we say we're training critical thinkers, we should be able to train ourselves to be open to hearing new things. In many ways, I think it's also very much focused and grounded in the relationship. Band, and we don't necessarily teach that way, I find. We teach a perspective of having something to deliver and make sure they heard it because we can't prove they learned it, but at least deliver it. And that's it. And that's where I think I came out of a system in England where I was basically told I, was very, I wasn't very bright. And um, I believed it for an awfully long time because I was useless in the old lecture hall thing. When I found my master, I felt I was evangelical. I was, yes, <laughs> because uh, I was asked questions. What do you need to know? How do you like to learn it? Good Lord, what a thrill. And suddenly I found I wasn't so daft after all, right? So you start to look at who's your client, who's the relationship with. If it's a person with HIV in the community, then let me come to where you're at as much as I can. How can I enrich where you are and what you need? Um, I think if we focus on learning as a process rather than learning mm -hmm. as product, um, then we don't position ourselves as experts. And um, this is what I've learned from this, uh, one of the many things I've learned from, from this book course is um, <coughs> the students become the experts because they take on the subject matter that I may know a little bit about, but they know a whole lot more than I do because they're doing the research. And so my job is just to guide them along the process rather than to tell them what is right or wrong. And I'm sure there are many times that our, our books might be factually, you know, controversial. But um, the, I think the best learning that I've experienced from students is allowing uh, that we're involved in a process and, and dealing with them as people. Now that may sound um, trite and maybe even a bit condescending, but uh, often we deal with the student or students, and, and we will talk about them as a group, but when you're engaged in this kind of intimate process of <clears throat> their creation and you, you're trying to help it along, um, all those things kind of fall away. And um, I think that's the most helpful uh, facilitation of the do. Uh, it's about the process of then uh, finding a new way of thinking about things rather than uh, positioning ourselves as experts. And I think that's the biggest thing I've learned in very many decades of teaching. <laughs> yeah, Northrop Fry talks about, um, he dispels the notion of inherent relevance. Um, you know, any discipline is as, is as potentially as relevant as any other, and he says any student worthy of the name establishes for him or herself the social relevance, the social value or relevance of what he or she is studying. Um, as an instructor, you don't just say, okay, well, <laughs> go to it. <laughs> um, establish that social value. I mean, you, you um, that's why I think uh, um, 
working with their work is so important and acknowledging um, their discoveries and their um, awakening sense of uh, the social role um, that, they are, that they are playing. So acknowledgement is a huge part, I think, of um, what faculty members can offer. I just I have to share this um, because it's a very poignant and it's stayed with me for a long time. Was um, one of my uh, um, facilitators, my person from the HIV who was facilitating, said to me, "I've only got a great education. I can't believe they wanted to listen to me and were listening to me." Um, and the students were. So it's it's what we define as expertise. It's a very important question. I'm wondering if our panel members have anything left in them that they had been dying to say when they knew they were going to come today. Because there are three things I'd like to do before we close. We have about half an hour, but I had said I'd close a bit early because a couple of people have got tight fits with another meeting. Um, so that's one. <coughs> what have you got left you wanted to say? Um, if all of you think about coming here today and why you chose to spend two hours of your day here, um, what's different between you now and you two hours ago? Did you have an aha experience? Did you have more of a confusion? Was there a phrase that sticks with you? Anything. Um, and the third thing is to give thanks to those who were here. So I can do that in two seconds or less, I think. But let's go to the panel first. Anything you else you wanted to say? Are you drained? Pensive. You're, you're pensive. That's nice. That's a good state to be ending up in, actually, because that means future things will come forth. Don't you think? Hopefully. No. So when you came, what did? What else did you prepare, or did you not? You just came and free associated to the moment. <laughs> wow. Sheila, you have something to say. I think I'm talking too much. Well, no, it's okay. We'll let you today because you're on a panel. All right. <laughs> I was thinking about the myths about community engagement because we that was one of the questions that we were asked to consider. And so I made a little list of myths. And one of the myths that we've addressed is that the community needs us, that we will be teaching and helping them which really is a top-down, often patronizing kind of way of being. The myth, may, the, the myth busting may be, yes, we may be useful to the communities, communities in which we engage, but we need to hear from them how we can be useful, and we need some humility in doing so, some rest. And the other thing is maybe we need them. Another uh, myth, I think, is that this will save us money, time, energy, whatevers. And again, this kind of work is a different kind of emphasis. You know, with the question around what kinds of rewards, is the institution ready for that? This kind of work is not a quick fix and not easy. It takes a lot of work. Any, all of you, I imagine here, have been involved, I think most of you I, that I know, have been involved in developing community connections in different ways. This is labor-intensive, complicated work. And so it's not a quick fix. It won't be short-term. It isn't easy. The idea of short-term projects, maybe, but sustainability is the thing we keep talking about, and making a sustained impact is what is really important. Um, another thing we often think about, particularly when it comes to student engagement, is that it's work or volunteer work. And I would really like to change, challenge that. I think there's a role for volunteer work, and I'm not at all, I think that the, the, the world needs volunteers. But that, I don't think, is what we're talking about. We're talking about learning and linking that learning back to what supposedly is the academic mission. It has something to do with creating lifelong learners, good citizens, leaders, all the stuff, that, the language we use. But it's not just work. It's activities, engagement, that links back and must have a reflective component in it to make it learning. Um, 
sometimes we think it's cheap. It's not cheap. It's going to take money. The myth is that it's a cheap way of doing things. It takes a lot of infrastructure, even in little projects. I'm sure, Patty, you didn't do that. And Anne, I'm sure you didn't do it with some sort of supports around you and infrastructure around you, even in little projects. We also assume, again, going back to student learning, that the myth that all students will like this and benefit from it. No. <laughs> Not everybody learns the same, values the same things, cares about the same things. If you know anything about even the old-fashioned cold learning styles, you know that not everybody learns the same way. So hands-on learning is not for everybody. And we do need to think about that when we're, if we're talking about student-engaged learning in activities. Um, and I guess the last myth is that we believe that everybody wants or needs the wisdom of the university or university education. And not everybody does need the university education or want the university wisdom or want university involvement. So it's a myth to think they really want us. Maybe we really want them. Gee, thanks for that. It was an uplifting part. <laughs> I'm known to depress people. <laughs> no, seriously, it's actually very helpful because you really focused in on quite a few things. Um, any comments about what Sheila just presented for us? No? So are our panelists worn and frazzled? They have no more to say. I don't believe that. I just don't believe that. Well, the See? only thing I might add is that we really need to think about how we evaluate our students in these experiences and how we evaluate the success of these experiences. It means we need to look at the process as well as the outcome. And so I think it necessitates that we look at different ways of evaluating that are meaningful to the context. Mm -hmm. And they may not be as, as traditional, perhaps, as we're used to, right? Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, is, oh, gee, Sorry, good I'll just add one thing. If we can get if we can find ways to get beyond what Virginia Woolf um, articulates as being locked out of the halls of higher learning, she says it's a terrible thing to be excluded, but it's maybe worse to be locked in, and how to get beyond either of those positions in a way also that's, that's not humorless. That's not, you know, there's joy, there's great joy in discovering um, here's my last literary illusion. Um, Krista Wolf's Cassandra talks about um, going beyond her comfort zone, um, taken by, she had the pri great privilege of being led um, by her um, um, servant into a community um, where she discovered how many, rea she was led to ask how many realities are there uh, besides mine, which I thought was the only one, and discovers great joy in in that. Yes. Um, yeah. In, yeah. Okay. So, thanks. So, I, I feel badly we should be, you know, this is, <laughs> there should be more laughter. <laughs> yeah, well, we've had a bit of a snicker. A bit, we a bit. Yeah, it's okay. And did you have anything else, or are you comfy? No, I think You're I comfy. Said, okay, so, what about you? When you came in this afternoon, and now, is there anything, I don't expect some incredible, in, uh, sort of uh, recognition of something life-changing necessarily. If there is one, please share it. But something subtle, perhaps, or something you've gathered. Yes, Susan. I just, I'm blown away by this people. The inherent humanity that, that we witness in that self-reflection, um, critical thinking, same time with humility. I'm very optimistic, so mm -hmm. I'm happy. I think maybe part of the answer to create that sense of excitement 
being exposed to the broader community mm -hmm. and all its variety. Yeah. Uh, it, it's really, thank you. It, it was really amazing. Thank you, Susan. Yes, Lori. Just to add to what Susan said, too, I do, I agree, I think you have a really great foundation here to build on. But something that struck me from what Connie said is about how all of the, the HIV patient was struck by that, that the students wanted to listen to him. But that you had this crowd of students who wanted to be there and listen to him is, is another slide to speak about, too, right? A bunch of people who actually really wanted to be there. And I think that's, that's the foundation we're talking about, right? So we have these amazing people on the panel that are also have a student body that's interested in participating in that. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to acknowledge that as well, that the students are willing and, and want to be part of them. Yeah, that's excellent. I <laughs> they have a right to choose. Yeah. Yes, Patrick. Um, uh, uh, I'm here to back up uh, Jean's I don't, I don't, I, I don't think that's, a, I imagine you've given more thought to this than anybody else in this room. Um, I don't know, is it going to look at uh, pockets of students out and about in whatever communities, as students and instructors? Are we talking about every course is co-taught with somebody from a community? Are we talking about embedding different kinds of knowledges into how, what we talk about and what we read? Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, but those are the kinds of things. I mean, if we're going to say it's not me standing up in a room dispersing pearls of wisdom, that it's actually I'm hearing wisdom from the students, from the community folks. I don't know. But it, it is really changing some of, some of those, those um, ways we go about it. I, I, I'm a big one, though, about we don't toss out babies with bathwater. There's some very fine things a university does. It's research agenda. It's solid educational agenda. Those are important things. So how do we hold on to those important things that, well, messing around, not at the edges, maybe with fundamental structures, but not lose sight of the good things that, that are already being done? It's and the important things. Can I say something? Can I just come away from here for a minute? Um, I, I, one of, you talk about dreams, and one of my dreams is having true mutual respect and regard across this campus. That in itself would facilitate all sorts of relationships popping up wherever, and certainly in places beyond where we can think about now. And it will also encourage boundaries to be broken down to our communities, whatever they are. Because uh, there are bits of that, but there isn't enough of that, and, and to me, that's the bit that's missing. From anyway, from, yes, Dale. I just wonder if we're, if we're missing something important. Every year, we send five thousand graduates out into the community. Um, they work and live there. We actually don't know much about what they do and what their experience at the master um, help them do when they arrive. Maybe we should be asking at what level can what we're doing inside help with what they're going to be doing afterward rather than think 
what we do now is assume there's a boundary transition. They graduate, they're off doing something, and it's unrelated to what they were doing while they were here. Many of perhaps even most of them. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, just a kind of extension of some of the things that have already been said. I think we need to make this place more porous. Um, the, in terms of people coming in, and, and people, the, we need more of a membrane and less of a wall. And um, I think part of what you're talking about, Dell, is you know people going out. But then, why don't we bring them back? Why don't we have a program where we bring our, our graduates back to teach what they have learned, you know, outside? And by the same token, why don't we bring some of these? people with an eighth grade education in, um, in, a, in a more systematic way um, to do more teaching. I think we can be much more porous than we already are. Uh, we can give people credit for life experience. Um, we have all these transcripts that, you know, the students must have graduated from high school with such and such an average and so on. Can we not consider bringing people in who have very different kinds of profiles? Um, who obviously will learn differently from the people who've come uh, the more traditional route. So I, th I think we can be a much more porous organization than we are, and it won't take a whole lot to, to, to be that way. We just have to think porous in a more porous way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe just two very quick comments. I was thinking about your comment earlier. You market McMaster University as a safe place. We tell the parents, the parents that when their son or daughter comes here, they will live within a boundary with emergency devices all over the place, with security, with a mechanism to keep the community away from son or daughter, Walter. as much if not more to learn from 
the community as we have to give. So those kinds of broad things. But I guess it was really the one message was the reference in the literature to community engagement. Mm -hmm. I just found that fascinating. Excellent. Very nice. Others, yes. Well, I found really interesting as you were talking about working with the HIV patients and how we find success <coughs> in that it Was that hard for me to give up? <laughs> <laughs> yes, thanks. That's a very good insight. Anything else that sticks out? Yes? Um, so I guess I'm a third year student and I've had some small uh, community engagement experience after this past semester with um, Health in the Hub. I was in that class. And um, something that struck me was when you were talking about after these community engagement experiences, how actually go back with the students and get them to reflect on what they're doing, to get them to take these experiences and how are you going to move forward with that? Because a lot of us come to university. I came because I want to get a great education. Um, I'm very idealistic, but I know a lot of my peers came because they're seeing this as the next step of what's going to turn into a career. My friends who are in the sciences and the engineering, a lot of them, they're seeing what are the skills I'm going to get out of this. So I just, when I heard that, I thought this is a really great idea to build on some incredible, like, I had, I, when I worked with Health in the Hubs, I thought that was one of the most incredible experiences. Mm -hmm. And we kind of did a reflection focus group after, but even just in some other courses to actually take that and have that before you go off for mm -hmm. the winter break. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thanks. Anybody else got this greater heart? Or even a warm, fuzzy feeling. Yes. <laughs> it's not particularly a great aha, I don't think, but I guess I feel as when I'm leaving with a sense of uh, some comfort that we've talked about community engaged education as something terribly variegated. I haven't been at the end now I'm listening to the words. Wasn't the title of the panel community engaged education? Mm -hmm. Only uh, Mark's comment about listening to Jean and me and as well talking about disciplines and uh, material that isn't at all to do with, I mean, could be, but it isn't necessarily to do with volunteerism, it isn't to do with going out into the world in, in a community engagement mode, but rather thinking about, uh, if, I, if I have it right, something to do with what do we hope students will think about as their place in the world, as their relationship to others, as their relationship to some sort of collectivity, which is a lot bigger or and more diverse than some of the professional programs like social work and nursing and rehab science that have particular be out there, do, engage, connect, blah, 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 that have action as associated with them. The other stuff has thinking attached to it. It may have action, but it's much more variegated. So I'm finding some comfort in the mix of uh, what we've heard today and the recognition that Sheila mentioned that um, this won't be something that fits all teaching situations and it won't be something that fits all learning situations. It's going to be confusing. Not confusing, <laughs> motley, and that's good. Um, it could be confusing too. It could also be confusing if you don't like motley, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> um, I guess the other thing that I'm leaving with, though, and I hate to be the sound cranky, but, or, or worried, I guess, but I think it's real, is that so much of what you've talked about, whatever variegated version of community-engaged education you're talking about, involves relationship. And relationship building takes time, whether that's um, Hattie or Sheila doing something in the community with students in a professional program, and relating to the people in the community whose work is going to be involved in that, or whether that's Jean taking a lot of time marking undergraduate essays in order that the marking and the feedback be a learning experience, not a number, and that thus you know the student. Knowing relationships um, take time, and they do, don't do well in classes of 500. Mm -hmm. And 
since we, we are going to, I mean, we're not talking about the resource bit and the labor implications. And I, I understand why, because this is a space to dream and think about the ideas, but, but once we hinge them to that, the rea those material realities, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure to see how to proceed at times. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to make that connection, and I guess that's what's to come. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you can leave that out. No, and I totally agree with you. And you're not grumpy or whatever word you said. <laughs> I am you are, maybe you are, but not in this context. Um, no, I, I think it's a very reasonable and rational thing to bring up at this stage. And I, but I think what this kind of open conversation can give us is that sense of comfort uh, with talking about it as broadly as we wish, and then start to look at really changing the academy is what we're talking about. That it's going to look very different 10, 15 years from now. Um, and I'll be looking down from my cloud with great interest to see how it all emerges. Um, or I may be in my nursing home, in which case I would really love a visit if you would like to come. So I'm on that somewhat uh, irreverent note. Um, I would like to thank the panel very much. I have stood here, and I, I, know, I know two of these women quite well, one very well, and two peripherally. Well, one hardly at all, and one sort of peripherally. That was Jean. Um, and, um, but it's been fascinating, and I found the experience of actually distilling some common thought from this was very, it was relatively simple. That all the points that you came from, however disparate, were in fact very much coming from the same place in here and with the intentions of community learning being much more explicated to me after today. I thank you all for your tolerance and me trying to crack my whip and some of you responded very nicely. And you are ingrained in my mind forever. So if I ever see you again in audience, I will be particularly beneficent to you. Um, Patrick, did you want to say anything else or are you comfortable? You're all right? Okay, I'm supposed to do the bookend thing. Uh, Patrick was very good at reminding us of the next two sessions. Um, not up there now. Uh, I don't think it matters, don't worry, don't panic. The Ava guy, don't panic. Uh, what's his name again? David? Oh, there he is, Theo Goldberg. And also a second panel of this nature, which is focusing more on international relations and developing uh, programs and projects in the international realm. Um, other than that, I would just like to thank you all for being here and it was great fun for me. Have a good evening.